Aloha, everyone, and welcome to another conversation taking us from anxiety to clarity. I'm Beth Ann Kozlovich from Sutter Health Kahimohala, and this series is a project of Brain Gain Hawaii and Evan Leong, ably recorded for us by Coco Leong, and also a project of Kahimohala with myself and my colleague, Trisha Kajimura. We're hoping that these conversations that we've been having for about 16 weeks now have been helping all of us to consider various aspects of what it means to have a world with COVID-19 and how we all can, can cope and help each other to cope. So where are we as we are on the very first day of August 2020? Well, we've had quite a week. We've had three successive days with almost doubling of the cases that we had uh, earlier in the week. And uh, the highest caseload that we had in Hawaii was 124 cases and many, many others who will probably be out there that we don't know about yet. But the real issue is talking about contact tracing and the number of contact tracers that we have and or maybe that we really don't have and need those who are hired, even if they're trained, but maybe not hired yet. That's what we've been talking about and what happens as the state goes forward. The Board of Education has voted to move school back until the 17th of August now. And we'll see if that date really goes forward. And we'll see what happens if the state actually opens on the 1st of September to Trans-Pacific visitors. And moreover, we're really hoping and, and looking for whatever best thing may happen for those people who are still unemployed, who have been lucky enough to have the 600 plus up per week in unemployment, but uh, who are going to need a whole lot more as we go forward. And as yet, we don't know what will happen exactly in Congress with the next round of funding. So that's pretty much where we are right now. Today, though, we'd like to stop and consider those people who are houseless and what COVID means now for them and what has been happening over the past many months as we've been dealing with COVID-19. And to help us do that, I'd like to welcome Heather Lust, the Executive Director of the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center, to the conversation. And Heather, always a good Good conversation when we get together, and thank you so much for making time today. Thank you, Beth Ann. You know, this is really what you've been focusing on for not just during the time of COVID, but well before that, you're, you know, ostensibly your whole career, looking at people who are in need and of late who are uh, needing services and are houseless or just dealing with a great deal of strife in their lives. As we've moved through these last many months, what transitions have you seen? Oh, thank you again for having me. You know, um, when I thought about the, this talk about anxiety and a lot of anxiety being that uncertainty and how things just change day to day, and yet when we talk about the houseless community, that's part of the resilience. Um, so what we know from some research is that folks that are houseless have very high levels of cortisol um, and are almost constantly in that fight, flight, or freeze, that higher state of anxiety. And uh, what, what we've heard from our houseless folks throughout this um, endemic is a heightened sense of that, but to be honest, almost um, for them, like, what's the big deal? Like, we're always trying to deal with basic necessities of getting our food, right? Or getting, you know, whatever the need is being more complicated now. And so it's, um, I've really uh, been inspired by some of the resiliency that we've seen in the community. Um, but of course, like any community, uh, really suffering with access to resources and, you know, the safety net is crumbling more than ever. And I think we're seeing that particularly um, with our community. So I think there's some some hope in some in some innovations that we're seeing that people have been able to do with these new times and trying to lower barriers to get resources out there. And I'm hopeful we continue those um, at the same time. Um, and I'm sure other folks have talked about this, the kind of layers of trauma going on top of folks is, um, it's just so much um, when we're talking about folks that are houseless, often community level, individual trauma and inter intergenerational trauma. So still trying to unpack all of that, but I'm seeing some, some hope in some of the ways that people are coming together um, and trying to make a better community. And, and that's what I keep trying to hold on to. With good reason. I think there, there's nothing like hope to keep us going from day to day and putting one foot in front of the other, whatever that path may be, homeless or houseless or with a home or with a job or without one, especially in, in the world of COVID-19. So let's unpack all of that 
a little bit, and then I think we'll come back to the hope because it's always good to end on a hopeful note. With those that you have seen who had difficulty getting services before, as you mentioned a moment ago, watching a social net crumbling under the weight of, of so many people who need so much now, far more than they did six months ago. How, how has the response been? Uh, you know, I, I know a lot of us get together and talk on, on the behavioral health and, and homelessness surge call, but aside from the conversations that we have, I mean, when you go out on the street and you're seeing people, what really is the, the response or what is it that can be done now given this crumbling structure? Yeah, so uh, I think there's a couple things in there. So first of all, the, I think the, the good news is that there's been at least a thousand tests statewide in, in our houseless communities. Um, and as far as we've known, we've identified three or four specifically that, um, and all of those were in some kind of congregate setting. We have not had, as far as I'm aware, any single um, outside unsheltered homeless uh, testing positive for COVID despite testing. Um, and so I think that there's some real success in the outreach efforts from uh, in the homeless community to get the information out. Um, early on, uh, Scott Morishige and his team had a red green placard that folks put on their tents, red being like, no, somebody in our encampment needs help, a uh, green meaning we're okay. You know, now we're able to go into and do more outreach, but folks remember back in mid-March, um, early April, everything was shut down uh, and there was very few people on the streets to even check in with these most vulnerable um, so what we heard from our folks then was that they, many of them hadn't heard of COVID, um, but what they were feeling was, I can't get all these basic services I used to get. The city and county had closed a lot of the bathrooms um, and just getting you know, basic needs met. And when we look at the hierarchy of needs, I feel like in some ways, the homeless outreach and harm reduction community is used to meeting basic needs and seeing a lot of these issues. And we were able to mobilize very quickly and ensure that some basic level of services were still out there. Um, as time has gone on and more services are opening up and people um, are able to get into treatment centers for their substance use or maybe get into housing. For example, we've housed four people in permanent housing in the past two weeks. That's all starting again. Um, it's almost like now we're seeing, um, at least um, at some of the outreach workers are telling me that we're seeing more concern about COVID itself. So we're also involved in the temporary quarantine and isolation center that opened April 1. We run the medical uh -huh. Yeah, at, yeah, on Ka'ahi Street, yep. And that is for anybody that does not have a, a place to isolate while they're waiting for their COVID result or if they're positive, don't have a place to be safe. Um, so that's mostly for houseless. Um, and we started April 1, we have had 97 people come through. Um, and what we found, especially as the numbers rise, as you've mentioned, the last three days have all been over um, 100 cases, is that um, now we're seeing that more uh, conversation um, and it's almost like now that some of their basic needs are met, we got food out there, right? We got masks out into the houseless communities. We reopened services. These, these increased rates we're seeing an increase in that uncertainty and fear um, and, and people that are houseless wanting to get tested. Um, and so there's some efforts happening um, now to try to bring testing to some of our communities in a thoughtful, phased way. And that's really inspiring, but really have to give it to the outreach workers and the homeless response that we haven't had the kind of outbreaks that I think many of us were worried we'd have. That was a big conversation months ago that they were, they were looking at this, that somehow this was going to be a core spreader or you know, super spreaders because people move around so frequently, but yet that hasn't happened. It doesn't seem Is to there, be. No, yeah. I mean, just from what you've said and just from the numbers that we've seen and looking at those who do have COVID within the, you know, the houseless community who were you know, clearly inside or got it from somebody who happened to be a worker in that organization. I mean, those things, because people are moving about, and granted, many of us have become far more lax in the way that we have approached safety protocols, and, and you can go virtually any place and see people who are standing far too close together, and, and very often, some of them are unmasked. So, I mean, we know that it wasn't the, the finger pointing that uh, we saw earlier on that it was gonna come out of the houseless community. But as folks are now able to get services though and are needing more services, given the fact that we're probably gonna be in this for much, much longer than anybody thought six months ago, how are you viewing the ability to do that outreach and continue 
to provide a lot of these services when so much of the, you know, the wherewithal to get those services for lots of organizations, including yours, are, are being, you know, threatened by the very need of money. Yeah, the money need. And then the other big one, um, Beth Ann, is because these folks have been in the community, they're at high risk for COVID. And as we just know, we had a, a, an outbreak in an outreach GUI, not at my agency, but another, but it took our whole outreach program down uh, for, because there was a couple that had it. So you're right. Um, we're really, I think, we're struggling with that on, one, on the one hand, um, particularly because many agencies like my own, we hire people with lived experience. So we're hiring people from the recovery community that are recovery from drugs and alcohol or that are formerly houseless or may have a chronic disease and then, you know, are more at risk. And so we're all very much, I think, um, find that balance of how do we support our staff and staying strong and resilient and building their wellness um, and trying to, you know, meet the community's needs. And so uh, what I've seen, though, has been some really some real innovation in the ways that that has happened. Um, I think one of the things that I, I, I am most inspired by has been the Bathroom Brigades, which is a, a group of people through Ahui Aloha mm -hmm. and people that are houseless themselves coming together and cleaning public restrooms so that people had a place to go, not just take care of their hygiene and their basic needs, but then to get toilet, um, get, be able to wash their hands or get hand sanitizer. Um, so we're seeing a lot of people take care of their own. Um, additionally, we have um, the Department of Health um, did uh, worked with the Hawaii Community Foundation to have these resilience hubs um, to be able to get PPE to agencies like ours. Since we weren't hospitals, we maybe weren't the first priority. Uh, and yet, Many of us are serving those that may be at risk for COVID. So anyway, that's getting out there and we're seeing a lot more masks and things that we're able to give to the houseless community so they can meet their needs. Um, and then lastly, I think what we're seeing is um, more agencies be able to kind of reopen even with these increased cases and figuring out how can they with staggering, uh, with lots of plexiglass, <laughs> uh, with lots of sterilization, still provide, for example, detox. You know, for a while, our one detox center only had six beds they could do safely. Oh. How do we keep ramping that up um, so that people can still get the services they need? Um, and, and one thing, one cautionary thing I'd like to put out there for listeners is we're seeing a little bit of a troubling trend where some service providers want a COVID negative before they can access their services, particularly ones that may be residential like mental health or substance use. And that's not a best practice. It's not recommended unless they have a risk factor Then, of course we want them to be tested. But we're finding that as an additional barrier to get into some services, um, given that COVID testing, especially in Hawaii, is we don't have all the resources we need to even test those that should be tested. And so we need to find these ways to, to do that. And so one way is screening. Uh, we're doing a lot on not the actual testing, but Partners in Care, uh, the Homeless Coalition developed mm -hmm. an app that the outreach workers go and use in the field to screen for, have you had a cough, a temperature? Have you been around somebody that has COVID? And it's actually geo-mapped um, onto this app. And we're hoping that eventually, um, as more we get that populated, if someone does test positive, we can go back and say, well, here are folks around that person. Let's go talk to them and see if they want to be tested. So I'm, I feel like that the continuum of response, even though we've probably should have had it many months ago, is really coming together on the education, the screening, the testing, um, the quarantine, um, but then transportation is still one of our biggest issues. We're mostly talking about folks that don't have transport um, and transporting people that are COVID positive um, and houseless and behavioral health challenges has its own unique needs. I can, I, can, I can certainly understand all of those things. Any one of those things might be a challenge enough, but yet when you put that trifecta together, that's a lot for you to have to cope with. And yet that's where we are with all of this. But it sounds as if though, you know, when you're specifically talking about that, that app, that it's a little bit like the contact tracing app that has been discussed for travelers. I mean, being able to log in, see what it is, keep it there, and be able to integrate that data. So then you have a way of mapping and being able to recall and you're not relying on memory or, you know, where people were uh, according to paperwork, but it's right there and you can integrate all of that and then overlay it to see how, how much you need to do with a particular group of people. But as now, you know, you're, you're able to do some of this stuff. I can also imagine though, that not only is the the need greater, but it has also been accelerating in certain issues. For example, substance abuse of just within, you know, the an, quote unquote average population several months ago, we saw a spike in alcohol sales and, you know, watching ads on TV and, and people talking about, all I want to do is sit home and drink until this is over. I mean, I mean, crazy memes 
that were maybe meant to be funny in a way, but the underlying reason for putting that out was really concerning. And I'm wondering that you know, with, whether you've been seeing this in the population that, that you serve, all of it, not just, you know, houseless, but in a lot of the population, which obviously is houseless that you serve, if this is also an increased substance abuse that you're seeing too, whatever the substance may be. Uh, we are. Uh, we're seeing it in our program and we're hearing from other programs that they are as well. What we don't have is that concrete data yet of because some of the, a lot of the treatment providers, their capacity was lower. Um, so what we're looking at is the CARES line, which is the, you know, 24, uh, merged with the crisis line July right, 1, right. You know, is the coordinated substance use and mental health access line. They are seeing a huge increase in calls. Um, for people who are wanting support. And it does seem like based on what I've heard from other agencies, our experience in there is that there's a couple things happening. One is that there's some relapse of people who were in recovery um, and had found a sobriety and a balance. Um, you know, if there's not a trigger of a national pandemic or maybe have losing someone that you love or losing your right. job or just all the loss that's happening has contributed to that relapse. Um, so there's that need and there's unique needs in relapse as well, particularly with opioids where we're seeing some increase in overdose, unfortunately. Um, and then we also are seeing um, on the other end, folks who cannot get their drug of choice um, and maybe going to alcohol or things they can't get or even wanting to stop. So we've had an increase in people, long-term chronic substance users, uh, particularly of methamphetamine and opioid who are like, I, I'm just tired of this up and down and I can't get it and I'm in withdrawal. And so we developed a kind of street detox guide um, and uh, our clinicians have been doing some telehealth Detox is probably not the right word, but helping from a non-medical place. How do you manage this? And then how do we triage them into treatment to harness this, um, the motivation they're having from how hard it's been to, to get to their, their drug? Um, so I've seen kind of uh, all across that spectrum. But what we do know is that it's riskier substance use regardless, because whether it's the relapse um, or, again, people's use ebb and flows, and that um, can lead to overdose because it changes their you know, dependence and their ability to you know, um, metabolize uh, the substance, whether it's alcohol or other. And then lastly, I did um, ask the state epidemiologist to do a quick run for me. Um, and from the poisoning side, and uh, why we've had increased calls to e EMS, it has not resulted yet in um, a higher rate of overdoses in the emergency room. So at least what, what I'm hearing then, it sounds like is still among the um, active using community, but hasn't at least translated to an increase in emergency room visits. But again, people are staying away from the hospital because of COVID, so it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but definitely an increased need to address it. Um, and so one thing that I think we're really proud of, Bethann, is that the TQIC, again, Temporary Quarantine Isolation Center, is a proof of concept for stabilization beds for both detox of substance use, but also crisis mental health stabilization. Uh, we have a white paper on the Department of Health website, that the HH Surge uh, website you mentioned, that talks about all the lessons learned from the first 60 patients. Um, and soon we'll be updating it um, as we hit 100 patients of how did we manage their substance use and mental health. I and mean, then we're really proud to say that 80% of the folks that came in while houseless did not go back to the street. Um, and many left the center more stabilized than they came in, um, especially with their behavioral health and substance use. And so we're hoping um, that this, this will build upon the foundation. Um, you were involved in the mental health task force last year, that all of this will show that we need this intermediate level of care. That's not the ED, but not programs. The person is too sick for the programs, but not sick enough, you know, for the ED or Hawaii State Hospital. And it looks like that we have some data now that this proof worked. And it's really um, encouraging to see that we can both respond to COVID and prove these, this behavioral health stabilization concept. You know, we, we've talked about these small silver linings that we may be discovering through COVID as horrible as it is. And believe me, one doesn't justify the other, but just seems to be that in going through this experience, we've also been able to see certain things that we had to turn on a dime to be able to do, and then found that there was proof of concept for things that have been talked about for a very, very long time. As a, as a you know, perfect example of what you've just said. So you know, that gap place of you know, too sick for this, but not, not sick enough for that has been where so many people have fallen through for decades and decades that it seems as if we can marshal this way in a better, uh, you know, a better direction or be able to husband all this information that we have and, and the way this has been developed 
and, and move it in a post-COVID world because there, there will be one at some point. And yet we will still have a great many people who still have issues with substance abuse in particular throughout Hawaii. Uh, what is it that you would really like to see happen in that scenario if uh, we're not necessarily dealing with, with COVID at a rate that we are now, because I don't think it'll go away entirely, no one does, but how, what might we be able to manage some of the issues that have been so long standing in Hawaii, but now have a proof of concept in that intermediary group that you just talked about? Well, just to take that example of stabilization, I know um, that uh, Deputy Director Mercero's idea is that as COVID goes down, then it, it becomes more of a stabilization center. Um, and if COVID goes up, then you kind of pivot and then it becomes more of a COVID center and that we can continue to learn lessons on both sides. I think that is his vision for the current center. Um, another amazing one has been not just telehealth, but the way that the federal government has made telehealth more accessible. Um, one concrete example is medications for substance use disorder used to require some in-person touches and right. some other things from clinicians. And now my clinicians can do it online through telehealth. And then one of my navigators can go and get the prescription and drop it off wherever that person is. And there's no contact and the person can get initiated on these medications and they can, you know, take them to a lab and get the lab test done in a way that's safe and so I think it's, I love this, um, this creativity of being able to move things on demand, whether it's online, doing this delivery, um, being able to take things more mobile. We're doing, you know, certain things in the field that we've never done before, again, safe wise. Um, and I'm hopeful that many of these will continue because I think we're showing that we've been able to lower barriers to behavioral health uh, services. And so far, as far as I know, there hasn't been that, like the sky hasn't fallen that I think we've been yeah. worried about, oh, if we do this then we might, the confidentiality might be broken or they might have an adverse reaction or whatever. And yet we've, we've been able to deal with it and so far not had any of those, you know, super negative outcomes. So those are a couple of them that have been really um, inspiring to me um, that I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll keep going. I think that's the biggest one, Bethann, is uh, those of us in the nonprofit sector or wherever you're doing services, why we want to be accountable to our funders and accountable to our community. Sometimes the documentation that it takes either to make someone eligible for a service or to, you know, to get reimbursed is so massive. How do we streamline that so that we're accountable for our community, but we provide services in a way that the person who's getting the service doesn't see how fragmented we are. Um, and I, I'm excited that I'm seeing some of that happen and I hope that continues. And that it's not just, oh, just during COVID, we can handle, you know, like a great example is a, a self-attestation or a non-wet signature. Um, for a long time, consumers couldn't get a service without those two right. things. And now we can prove and say, well, they don't have any money and they're saying they don't have any money. Can we please just give them this service <laughs> instead of having to prove that they have no money? Um, so I'm really grateful that we keep trying those and let's hope that the policymakers and our um, folks in government can see that again, they can change these systems to be lower barrier and yet we can still be accountable to show that we're using the funds in an appropriate and effective way. Yeah, two things with that. I mean, first about the, the money part of it, being able to demonstrate that the money becomes more effective when you're able to do things in, in a way that not only has the efficacy behind the, the medical part of it, but also is able to have the accountability that with the mountains of paperwork and the time to do all that means you can't necessarily serve many more people or that you, know, you have your staff just buckling under the weight of all of that and that there are better ways to do things than, than we thought. And this has just caused this, this incredible stratospheric jump that people have had to make because we've been talking about telemedicine, for example, for how long? I mean, yeah, decades, very you know? long time, exactly. And all of a sudden, now when we had to do it, which proves that we can do it, and hopefully being able to take these lessons and use them in a different way going forward, so that we're able to help a lot more people. But one thing that I wanted to ask you about because so much of your work is based on the relationships that you're able to establish with the people you serve in whatever way you serve them, whether it's you know, from you know, those who have HIV, those who are houseless, they may be both, those who are using substance abuse, they may be all three of those, I mean, whatever it is that you have is so relationship-based. Has there been any change in that because you're now talking to people through screens? Yeah, 
There has, um, and as you know, um, kind of social isolation is take is bigger than um, smoking, um, obesity, and many other health determinants when it comes to poor health outcomes. We know that isolation and loneliness is, mm. is big, particularly in the, in our community. So. We've tried a few innovative things, as to have some others. Um, we have, for example, um, one of our APRNs that has a psych background does coping with Courtney um, on Zoom every week, and they can ask questions and can not not show their face if they don't want to, or you know. So we've done that, that piece. Um, I'll be honest. We also some of my staff go out and they talk through not this screen, but the screen at the house for those that are housed, where they'll actually stay outside and still see them through the door just to be able to have that kind of personal connection or even be outside in their car and call them and wave. And I know that sounds small, but even just that little bit of like, hi, I'm here, I know where you are, I'll bring things to you, um, you know, so I think our housed folks that have technology, mm -hmm. um, we've been able to do well. Our unhoused folks is a different story. Um, and it's been challenging because we have a much more physical relationship with them and to have to be like, no, we can't hug you. Or um, at our van, they have to stay six feet back and they don't want to. And it's been, oh, it's been such a challenge because we want to allow them services. But then, you know, we have to say, but you have, to, my, our, our staff aren't comfortable if you don't stand back. And so that's been um that's been tough and to help them see that the boundaries not because they're not worthwhile it's not that we think that they're diseased or that we're trying to perpetuate stigma but just that this is what we need to do to keep our staff safe so that they can keep coming um, and really trying to make that message because so many of these folks are so stigmatized especially people with hiv i mean the parallels with hiv Bethan, are, are powerful but people with hiv for a time weren't touched you know, hello, Ryan Wayne was allowed in school. I mean, and so there's these the, the, these reminiscence of of that same stigma or that same of like that fear. That's why you don't want me to come close is because you don't you know you think I'm diseased and it's so we've had to really try to break that down and say no, it's really we're all scared and we're not saying that, but we need to be safe so that we can keep coming and supporting you and. Yeah, how do we change that message? And luckily, I think most of the time people have been understanding, um, but boy, it's hard. Um, and it's hard when we get the calls, can you please, I'm so, please just come by, I need you. And having to call EMS for them instead of being able to go and really, it probably wasn't EMS, but we just aren't sure that their mental health is well. Yeah, um, but again, trying to do every little way we can. Um, and we do a lot of delivery. So we did a lot of delivery of food, even to tents and houseless where we would go. We work at the food bank. Um, we have distributed almost 20,000 tons of food since the beginning of April um, with uh, up to 12 food drops a month, um, an area that we, we didn't do before, but pivoted because of the need. And that was an incredibly way to show touching of like, I can't come touch you, but let me give you something nourishing. Um, we got a blanket donated from Hawaiian Airlines. Here's a blanket, here's some food, here's a face mask and some hand sanitizer and some information about COVID, we care about you. So just kept doing that. And then lastly, I wanna share that, um, I think it was Kanu Hawaii, who's been that really great resource of people who wanna donate. So we've gotten these beautiful handmade cards from people all over the place, even all over the country. Um, and then we've been able to hand those out and just say things like, we're thinking about you or you're special or you're meaningful. And whether we hand them out and leave at a 10 or whether we send in the mail to our house folks, we've heard that that's made a big difference. And I just want to give a shout out to all those volunteers who've been making face masks and making homemade cards and doing things from their isolated homes, knowing that it, it, it put a smile on someone's face because it has. Um, you know, there's many ways to show love and, and we know about the connection between food and love. Boy, we know that one. Yeah, yeah. But all those little things that mean so much when we can't hug someone, when we can't be physically close to them. Uh, you know, even talking about the, the inverse of why they have to stay away six feet or have a mask. I will often say to people, it's because I'm around a lot of people and it potentially, I don't want to, I, I don't want to share this with you because I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not around a lot of people in the way that I was before, but still I'm not just isolating in my house. If I'm going to the store, if I'm going to the hospital, if I'm going to I mean, work at the hospital, if I'm going to do whatever it is we're needing to do, I don't know that, uh, you know, I, even with all of the things that I've done. So I often tell people that, you know, I'm, I'm wearing the mask for you. And I'm staying, you know, this aside from you, even my very best friends, right. you know, um, it's, it can be really, really tough unless somebody's in your family bubble and you're seeing them really, really frequently and they live with you. Uh, it's, it's still maintaining that distance and it's tough because it's not our natural way. I mean, we're very much herd animals and it's very tough.
But those little touches wired that you for connection, right? We're wired for exactly. Connection. Well, that's what keeps us alive. We know even with elders that if they don't have enough connection, that they simply fade away. Little babies who aren't touched and held and feel that connection will simply die. I mean, we we know this as a society, but knowing that in the context of COVID uh, makes it all the more challenging for how we have to behave going forward. So well, it's good to hear that I, you're being able to do some of those things. Yeah, and early on, I changed it. But then I don't call it social distancing. I call it physical distancing. It's exactly. Social, social connection. Because we need connection. It's the physical distancing that we need to stay safe. And I hope that more adopt that because we don't want to be socially distant. We want to be physically distant. Um, yeah, and isn't so. it funny, though, because we started to talk about that earlier on. And yet I, I still see all the posters that say things with you know, social distancing and people talking about social distancing. Uh, we, we need a real movement to say that it's only physically distant. You know, people have loved each other uh, halfway around the world, you know, for years if they've had to, uh, because they've been separated by wars or separated by countries or what have you, that we can do that. We have the human capacity to do that, but sometimes we have to be physically distant. And in this case, it may only be six feet as opposed to a world away, but sometimes it feels like a world away. So as you're hopeful for how some of all of this may help us going forward, what's next for you that you would like to see happen that would really make a world of difference as you're dealing with the, you know, the houseless community, which may be on the street and those who may be sheltered, whether they're temporarily at uh, Kaahi or whether they're at Kauai Village or whether you know, they're out at the, you know, the post camp out at Kaili Lagoon any place where they might be, uh, what do you think is going to be the, the next level of this that is going to make a difference for those who need so many services? Well, um, personally, and I know that I differ from some, um, I feel like that during COVID, some of our established encampments may need to stay in place. Um, and actually, I'm not the only one that feels that way. The Center for Disease Control was very clear that disrupting encampments is a risk for COVID spread. Um, and at the same time, I do understand that some of our communities don't have the access to the hygiene they need, things like that. But I think we've learned from whether it's Pu'u Honua, Waianae, um, and the group out there, um, or whether we have the um, uh, Kapo'e'o Kaka'ako group and Kaka'ako that came together, um, and a lot, a lot of them are at um, Hali Maliola. We also have the Waimanalo group. We have three, as far as I know, kind of really uh, rather tight houseless groups that have come together, created community. So for me, it is that community that is where that resilience is. Um, and I know that on Kauai, for example, um, the mayor um, and the county allowed some parks to be open for camping and then had those be open so that people could have access. I personally believe that until we can get more housing, um, I believe housing is a human right. And until we can have more affordable housing, how can we do create it as safe out there for people as possible? Um, not to have you know, havens where people can hide from law enforcement or exploit others, but create community and do it in a safe way where um, they're able to shelter in place in the way that they're best able to. Um, but of course, getting more housing, I would love to see us do hotels like the continent has, Bethan, that, that, you know, they've done a lot of great work with our hotels and the houseless. Um, we have some empty hotels sitting around and um, I personally hope that there may still, not that I want the hotels to be empty, but I'm hoping we don't have an influx of visitors given these numbers. So could we do more with the with the hotels and having some of our um, houseless families or other folks that are houseless there to uh, decrease COVID ri uh, risk? Um, so, you know, we, we're learning some lessons there and I'm, I'm hopeful that we can continue to learn from the continent and also um, build upon the wisdom of our communities of houseless folks who come together about what they need because many of them know they did the bathroom brigades they came together and said let's clean that um the other well, big thing is oh sorry go ahead no i was just saying and, and even even before we hit covid there were members of the houseless community that were coming together to be able to do cleanups of, of their areas i'm thinking about as you head to y manalo certainly around where you know the children's discovery center is down in kaka'ako where you know, that the self, I don't want to use the word policing, but the self-regulation of that community for the good of all so everybody would be safe and not tolerating things that were not. I think that's when you find a community really is pulling itself together when that becomes the ethos and that becomes the driving force. And seeing that happen means that it can happen. People were so surprised that right. that was happening. Like, 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 why would it? Well, because they care, because they're dependent upon these you know, resources as much as anyone else's. 
And I think that kind of goes to the next point I wanted to ask you about, which is, you know, shifting the mindsets of everybody else. I mean, when we would talk about the people who were, you know, homeless, people had ideas of, you know, the drunk on the corner. Uh, they had, you know, people who were out there, you know, you know preying on others uh, or who were just, you know, nasty and, and didn't want to be, you know, part of society. They were antisocial I mean, all the all kinds of things that brought up these certain types. And then we found out, no, really, it's families or people who have lost jobs. There are people who are mentally ill. They are veterans. All of this for years and years and years on air and off, uh, I'd be talking about with, with people. And it seems that they, we've made some little inroads in the, you know, the public psyche about all of this. Um, is that just me thinking it? Or, or are you seeing any of this change in the way people understand what it means for those who are houseless and who we're really talking about? That's such a good question. You know, I was feeling hopeful and then I saw a, a, a poll in the Star Advertiser that said that most people feel like it's getting worse. Um, you know, it's interesting because the the point in time, we're doing so much better than every other West Coast city. Um, uh, when you look at point in time, we're the only major West Coast city that had a decrease in our homelessness according to point in time this um, in 2020. So I, I feel like that we have a lot of lessons learned, but how do we translate that when communities feel like in Chinatown, for example, that their storefronts or that their businesses are still threatened or people feel like they can't go to the park, um, you know, to run their dog or, so to me, it's how do we do both and, how do we both find a place that housing is a human right and people have that access and acknowledge that this is an entire community issue. It's not this us and them. Um, I, or I'm thinking about what's happening in Kailua where there's a affordable housing project up and it's not been recommended by the Kailua neighborhood board and there's been a lot of community opposition and yet there hasn't been affordable housing in Kailua in my understanding in almost 30 years. So what, you know, what will it take? And so, I, yeah, I want to move to that, what's called YIMBY, yes in my backyard instead of the NIMBY. Um, and there is some research talking about well, what does lead to YIMBY and it is that win-win. Um, and so it's like, well, what, how have we addressed this that it's been a win-win for our business community um, and for our communities? And I don't know that I have the answer, but I feel like we are finding little pieces um, that have been successful, like you just mentioned. Um, but how to have that be synergistic with, you know, our communities who feel like that there's no room in their community for a new housing project or a detox center or a stabilization center or whatever other service our community needs, that I feel like we still as a community need to problem solve. Because um, I see it every day and, 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 and no community wants certain things and yet we all agree we need them. How do we find that, yeah, that balance? And I guess the last the basis thing- of, Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, the one place I do see more empathy, um, I would say, um, is in the people's understanding of how the chronic mental illness has contributed to the challenges. Um, I think that for a while, people, oh, those substance users, it's just those drug users. And whether it's been, you know, um, the hibiscus drive with the police incident, um, we had a really tragic incident with a nurse who was um, killed a couple of days ago from somebody who had mental illness. And so more and more, whether it's through the crisis intervention work at HPD or others, people are getting that this is also a result of the breakdown of our, of our community mental health system and the fact that our Hawaii State Hospital only has very little room and you know all of these pieces. But I'm, I'm hopeful that that gives some empathy because, you know, it, it could happen to so many of us where we could have um, either mental health or lose our job with COVID and it could be us. And, and more that people realize it could be them, I see that ability to have the tougher conversations. We've turned the conversation back into a much more hopeful perspective than some of the things that we talked about before. Is there something else that you really feel particularly hopeful about now at this point of time as we're coming into you know, today's the first day of August and who knows what the rest of this year will bring. But as you're looking at the lessons learned from the last you know, six months or so, all the things that we've talked about, is there something that makes you much more hopeful now? Yes. Um, and that's collaboration. Um, whether it's bringing the homelessness and the, and the behavioral health together, like the BHH surge. surge. Yeah. Um, I'm going some, some, what I call non-traditional collaborations, folks that I didn't know that I collaborate with or didn't think I would want to, honestly, and they're successful. Um, people are getting over, um, I love this term that Eddie uses, is principles before personalities. And I'm seeing that in a crisis, people are putting aside, you know, whether, whether it's ego or pride or credit 
um, and really getting in and doing this. And I, I am inspired by that. Um, and I feel like as more, if we, the more that we can do that, because we all often have that same goal and yet our different pathways, our different beliefs or values or whatever, then somehow we get diverted because our whole goal is having healthy, safe, productive society in Hawaii. And in fact, I think most of our folks want that um, with, a, with a clean environment and people have access to the resources they need. So how do we then keep that as the goal um, and put aside a lot of these other territorialness or all that? And I see a lot of that go to the side out of the essentialness of just saving lives and getting resources out there. And I really hope that continues. That spirit of collaboration across all different sides has been really inspiring to me. And I've learned a lot and it's been a humbling experience to be like, well, what have I held on to or not done before that has prevented a successful collaboration? Um, and, and I'm seeing others have the same and just tough conversations because we don't have time, to be honest, for some of this stuff anymore because we just got to right. get in and do it. We um, don't have time for fiefdoms. We don't have time for squabbling think, over money. We only have time to get the job family, done. Or you didn't yeah. include me or That's you aren't right. doing it or whatever it is. We don't have right. time. People are dying. Right. That, so it's That's really, right. it's been very um, humbling and freeing to move past some of that and see the magic that has been created when, when we didn't stay in our little silos and well, this is the way we do it. And this is how I have to show up if I'm going to do this. And yeah, I, I hope I, we keep evolving. I hope I keep evolving. Um, Cause it's been the transformation and innovation has been in a market speed and we can keep what's working and, uh, and Jettis and the rest. Go with the rest. <laughs> yeah. Heather, I thank you so much for spending the morning and, and talking to us a little bit more about, your vision and and what you've been experiencing as you know you all have been coming through COVID along with the rest of us and and giving us some hope for the future for how all of us might be able to collaborate better and to do it faster and really keep our, our eyes on what we're trying to accomplish which is saving lives thank you so much i wish you all the best i'm right there with you yeah thank you beth and thank you for doing this so much i really appreciate you highlighting this and normalizing that I don't know a person that's not anxious during these times. And so thank you for having this space to really start to talk and unpack all of that. Thank you for having me. Well, pleasure, truly a pleasure. And for those of you who joined us today, if there's a conversation that you think that we should have, let me know. You can email me at KozlovB, that's K-O-Z as in zebra, L-O-V as in Victor, B as in boy, at Sutter Health, all one word, dot org. KozlovB at SutterHealth.org. And if you have a question, we'll make sure that you get an answer, I promise. And we hope that you'll plan to join us next time for another conversation to take us from anxiety to clarity. Aloha. <laughs>